like to greet you in the name of Jesus. I appreciated the last song, Brother Rob, and also the comments by James. What stands out to me in the, in the verse he quoted is that he will do it. Not that I will do it, but he will do it as long as I faithfully allow him to use me. That is a challenge and a promise. The last verse of the song we sang, A Charge to Keep I Have, has always been uh, meaningful to me. Um, it can be viewed by some as a negative. It goes like this, help me to watch and pray and on thyself rely. Assured if I, I my trust betray, I shall forever die. It's a negative promise, if you will. If I do well, good. But if I don't do well, if I betray the trust that the Lord has committed to me, then I shall forever die. And that can be viewed as a negative. Somehow, to me, I view it as a promise that if I do my part, I can completely trust in the Lord that his promise is true. Am I, if I can be faithful, then there isn't a question if he'll be faithful or not. He is faithful. Brother Rob said, everyone has a charge. I would echo that. As I speak tonight, I'm obviously going to be speaking um, to the two brothers and sisters up front here, but I'm speaking to you. There is not many of us, and you've probably heard me say this before, but there's not many of us that are not leading in some way, shape, or form, either in our own homes, as teachers, or even if you're here as youth, somebody is looking to you and following you. You are leading. And the question will always come, how am I doing it? Am I leading people to God, to the Good Shepherd, or am I leading away? from the Good Shepherd. You might have deduced what my text is by saying that. The title of my message is Shepherding the Flock, and my text is out of John, chapter 10, the first 18 verses. And you all know this story. It is not unfamiliar, but I'm going to endeavor to point a few things out as encouragement to, to how we lead. One of the things, as before we look at this passage, is this. We need to understand what a sheepfold is. If we don't understand what a sheepfold is, we're going to miss part of what is being taught. A sheepfold, in the time that this was written, was a walled-off place, possibly right up against the shepherd's house, but more commonly, um, outside the wall of the city, maybe even out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the fields, in the middle of nowhere, possibly even there. And it was usually stone walls, it wouldn't have to be, but it was often stone walls, and the height could be varying, but anywhere from maybe several feet high up to the height of a man. Sometimes there was wood, and briars or sharp stones on the top of it. It was a place of safety for the sheep at night. If it was right outside the shepherd's house, then there may be a gate there that the shepherd could close, put the sheep inside and close, and go, go to his home. More commonly, again, there was not a gate, and you'll see in the passage it uses the word porter, but that's really a watchman. Sometimes the shepherds took turns that stayed there to protect the opening or the gate as the gate overnight. The shepherds would bring their sheep, they'd put them all in there, and they'd go home for the night. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Being a shepherd was not a glamorous job. 
It was really one of the lower jobs. It was a dirty job. And this point is pretty significant. If you were a shepherd, you smelled like a sheep. And if you don't think sheep smell, that's because you were never around them very much. Because sheep do smell. And their, their wool is oily. And if you spend any time around sheep and get against them, the oil kind of transfers to you and you quickly smell like a sheep. John chapter 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door in the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. He calleth his own sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. Verse 1 and 2 is pretty plain. The legitimate shepherd had no reason not to go into the door. If he was going around, he's in a legitimate business. He had no reason to climb up on the wall or climb over the wall to get into the sheep. The implication here is that one who went over the wall or didn't come in through the door was an imposter and he was looking to steal sheep. Now, he might have been looking to steal them the obvious way that comes to mind, but I think you'll see a little later as we go on here what I mean when he also might have been looking to steal them by developing a relationship with the sheep. And that is pretty important, I think, in our time. And you'll hear me say this later, but whose voice am I listening to as a sheep? because an imposter could steal sheep by winning their trust. And it's very true today. We can be deceived, we can be led away from the truth by an imposter gaining our trust and by us listening to his voice. Verse three, to him the porter, literally the gate warden, opened and left the legitimate shepherd in, or more commonly, the sheep out. But the shepherds could trust that porter to keep the sheep while they went home with their family. And tonight we're having an ordination for a minister and a deacon. And I would like to say, I would like to make this analogy that the porter's job was very much like the deacon's job in the church today. It was looking out and caring for the needs of the sheep and assisting the shepherd in protecting and watching out for them. The gate warden or porter was literally much like that. He provided a safe place for the sheep to be when the shepherd wasn't there. He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. He, when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep will follow him, for they know his voice. Now, what I just described to you a little bit ago sounds like a big mess. Let's just say five or ten shepherds come with their 50 sheep, or however many they had. I'm making up the number. And they turn them all in this pen. I put my 50 in. Frank puts his 50 in, and John Adam puts his 50 in. This is sounding like a pretty big mess, isn't it? The sheep are all mixed up. They're going to be all mixed up by morning. Well, let me tell you a little story, because that's, that is a true thing. The sheep are going to be all mixed up. But we need to understand sheep. This story will make that plain. Rick Crandall tells this story. In the mid-1900s, there was an evangelist named Bill Rice who went to the Holy Lands, and he grew up in Texas in cattle country. He was a cattleman, and he went to the Holy Lands, and they, they observed this shepherd out in the middle of the grazing land with his flock of sheep. And it was a very idyllic setting. The shepherd was there. The sheep were all scattered around grazing. I mean, it was a, uh, an idyllic setting. 
And here comes this other shepherd with his flock of sheep. He walks up to the first shepherd. He gives him a hug, shakes his hand. They start talking. And the sheep start mixing themselves together, banging and sniffing noses and mixing themselves all up. And Rick's saying, this is a disaster. I mean, this is a cattleman's nightmare. Two herds of cattle get mixed up together. I mean, this is going to be a disaster when they decide to go their own way. Well, as they watched, the third shepherd came. Same thing. He greets the first two. His sheep, they mix in with all the other sheep. And by this time, Rick's about probably fit to be tied uh, at the mess that they have. And after a, a bit, the one, one shepherd finishes chatting with his brethren, and he, he just turns around and walks away. And when he's about 30 feet or so away, he starts saying, mm -bah, mm -bah, mm -bah. and, you know, Rick says, I couldn't believe it. He's like, the sheep lift up their heads, they start walking, sorting themselves out, and they follow him off. And after a while, the other guy does the same thing. His sheep sort themselves out. They follow him up. He said, you know, I couldn't believe what happened. The shepherd never looked back. He didn't bother counting them. He just walked off and the sheep followed him. Now that I told you that, you know what this passage is about. The shepherds did not need to look if their sheep were with them or not. They knew that the sheep were with them. I'll tell you another story just to illustrate that point. And I don't know who tells this story. But there was a shepherd that had part of his flock stolen overnight. And he couldn't figure out what happened to him. He couldn't find them. So he went to the sheep market in the nearest town. And the gentleman that went with him didn't know anything about sheep. He thought he was crazy. Why are you going to the sheep market? If the thieves stole your sheep and they're going to sell them, you'll never find them amongst all those sheep. But what happened, he went to the sheep market and did exactly what I described to you, and his sheep came out of the crowd, and they came to him. When Jesus says, my sheep know my voice, and they will follow me, that is what he's describing. He don't have to have his sheep marked. He don't have to know where they are all the time. When they hear the shepherd's voice, they will follow the shepherd. To finish my story up about Bill Rice, he was so fascinated by this that several times when he was over there, he went to where sheep were and he tried to see if he could call him too. And it, he was never successful, which frustrated him a little bit because he could never get the sheep to pay any attention to him. But being a cattleman and a, and a lover of animals, he kind of had this desire that it, it would be nice if he could get the sheep to, to follow him as well. Verse 5. A stranger will they not follow, but they will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, and they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. They didn't understand the story of the shepherds and the sheep. And I just told you the story and you connected, I believe. I believe you understood what I was talking about. And you say, well, why didn't the people here understand what the Lord was saying? And it's simply this. When I told you the story, you made the spiritual connection. When they heard the story, they didn't make the spiritual connection. Even though in Isaiah chapter 4, even though they knew in Isaiah chapter 40 verse 10, it said this, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Verse 11, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom 
and he shall gently lead those who are with young. Now, I'd like to take you back to chapter 9. And there's a story there, again, that's very common. It's a story about the blind man who Jesus made mud, put it on his eyes, and told him to go wash, and he could see. And you might not know right away is why I'm taking you back there to make this point, but I think it will become clear. But I need to tell you one thing about this story that we miss. This is one of the healings where the blind man, nor anyone else that we know of in the story, did not ask to be healed. He didn't ask for Jesus to heal him. Um, if you go to the beginning of chapter 9, it says, and, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. You know the story, Jesus healed him. He came back. The Pharisees gave him a hard time about who healed him and what happened and all that. What I find that's interesting is a man didn't know Jesus. He was blind. He couldn't see him. Jesus didn't exactly tell him who he was. And yet the blind man knew that he was a good shepherd. And we see that by going to verse 30, I believe. Chapter 9, verse 30. And this is the blind man answering to the Pharisees after they kept pressing him who it was that healed him. He, then the man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, referring to Jesus, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, it was not heard that any man opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered him and said unto him, Was thou altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. And we know what happened next. Jesus finds him. The good shepherd finds him. Down in verse 35. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and worshipped him. So the blind man recognized the good shepherd without a problem. This little story illustrates exactly what chapter 10 is illustrating. The Jewish leaders were thieves and robbers. They kept those from going in that wanted to, and those that went in, they threw out. They weren't the good shepherd. A little later, it refers to hirelings. And they may not have even been that good. But they were stealing and killing and destroying. Yet all the while, they were holding themselves out as leaders and shepherds. Let's go to verse 7 back in chapter 10. Then Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. Just as I illustrated, the blind man didn't hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and he shall go in and out and find pasture. I omitted a part of the story uh, when I was telling you about sheepfolds. And it's simply this. Those sheepfolds that were out in the middle of nowhere, they didn't have a gate or a door. So they put the sheep in there for the night. And then what happened is the shepherd or shepherds, which was often the case, they laid down in that opening. They were the door. Again, when you understand what happened, this all of a sudden comes alive. 
He said, I'm the door. I lay down in the door. And the sheep go in and out and they find pasture. I don't know if you thought about this, but as long as I'm in the sheepfold, I could actually starve to death in the sheepfold. There's nothing there to eat. But I'm safe. The wolves won't get me at least. And I won't get stolen. But Jesus is not only the shepherd that provides that. He is a shepherd that provides the abundance, the ability to go in and out because he guards the door when I need it and he goes out with me when I need to eat, when I need to grip, when I need pasture. He provides the protection and the safety for both my safety when I need the protection and my blessing when I need the food. I already said there in verse 8, all that ever came before him were thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. And down in verse 10, the thief cometh not but to steal and to kill and destroy. But I am come that they have, might have life and have it more abundantly. And again, when you contrast what I just showed you in chapter 9, the Jewish leaders versus Christ, there's a big contrast. In Christ, they had life abundant and protection abundant. With the Jewish leaders, it was to steal and to kill and to destroy. Just the opposite of abundance and blessing. Verse 12, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. There's this repeating theory that not only does the shepherd know the sheep, but the sheep know the shepherd. There's this, it's repeated throughout this passage. Now, I'm going to deviate a little bit here because I've been talking about shepherds and sheep. And to a certain extent, as leaders, we are under shepherds, under Jesus Christ. And we are charged with giving oversight to the flock. But the analogy breaks down a little bit because we're also sheep. I may be a shepherd, but first and foremost, I'm a sheep. So you say, well, how does this work? Well, I'm going to tell you a little more about sheep. So if you have a flock of sheep, just about of any size, but at least if you have more than a half a dozen or so, there's going to be a sheep in that flock, and the old terminology for it was called bellwether. And the idea of that is every flock of sheep is going to have one sheep that's a leader. It may be a ram, but it may not be. It may be a ewe. But there's going to be a sheep, or if the flock's big enough, there's going to be multiple sheep that the other sheep will follow. And the idea of bellwether comes from the shepherd would take that sheep or those sheep and he'd put a bell on it. Because wherever those sheep with the bells are on, that's where the other sheep are going to be. And he don't necessarily have to see them, to know that, he can hear the bells and know where the sheep are. And I would like to propose to you tonight, most of us as leaders, whether it's fathers and mothers or school teachers or ministers or deacons or you name it, most of us as leaders, we're all sheep. Now what's interesting about bellwethers the other attribute they had that the sheep will follow them, the other interesting thing about them is typically they'll have a closer relationship with the shepherd than some of the other sheep do. So we raised sheep when I was growing up and um, the story I'm going to tell you is 
about, it was a ram in this case that the rest of the flock followed. We had maybe a dozen, 15, I don't know, somewhere in their sheep at any given time, sometimes more, sometimes less. But he had a bell on, and what is interesting about him is he actually, I had a good relationship with him. So if I'd go out to the pastor and call him, and by the way, Frank, his name was Ted, Theodore. Um, and if I would call him, he could be clear. We had about a 15-acre, 18-acre pasture. He could be at the other end. And if I'd go out there and holler Ted, he'd come out running, and the bell would be jingling, and all the other sheep would come with him. And he, he literally would, I could about do anything with him. He, he liked just hanging around there if I was out there. Now, if he wasn't around for some reason, you'd go out there and call the sheep, and they'd come eventually because they thought they might get feed. They'd come eventually, but they wouldn't come nearly like when he was there. I tell you that story to say that is what God is calling us to be as leaders. He's, we need to remember that we're sheep. But we need to remember who the shepherd is and the relationship that we have with him. That when the shepherd calls, we know his voice and he comes. I didn't tell you this, but I think you know it. It's, it's well nigh impossible to sh chase sheep. They'll run you to death. They can run faster than you can. It's well nigh impossible to chase sheep, but you can lead them anywhere you want to if they trust you. They'll follow you. You don't have to chase them if they trust you. Do I know, as a leader, do I know the good shepherd? Have I learned that I can go in and out and find pasture? Have I learned that when I follow the good shepherd, or when I align myself with a group of people who are following the good shepherd, that there is abundant life in that, and it is a safe place. And more than that, as a bellwether, have I learned that I don't want to follow the voice of a hireling or a thief. And is my motivation the same as the motivation of the good shepherd that I care for the sheep, not for the wages I get, but because the sheep are the most important thing to the shepherd. You know, the most important thing to the Lord Jesus Christ is you and I, people. He died to save me and you. And he would have died to save me and you if we were the only ones. The most important thing to our Lord and Savior is people. And if I can catch his heartbeat, that I care about what he cares about, then I won't be working for wages. I'll be working because I love him. And I'm his channel to the flock. Quickly go to verse 16. Jesus says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I must also bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. This could be portrayed in a number of ways. The way I'm going to portray it tonight is, I believe Jesus was speaking here of the Gentiles to the Jewish people. And I don't think the disciples understood when he said here what he was talking about. But post-Calvary, I think they understood perfectly what Jesus was saying. That the, the sheepfold was going to be open to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And there would be one fold and one shepherd. He goes on to say, as the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. 
actually says that in verse 15. Verse 17, therefore does my father love me because I lay down my life for the sheep. What is significant here is Jesus laid it down. They didn't take it from him. He laid it down, he took it back up again, and he will not lay it down again. He is now king of king and lord of lords. But he was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. Again, exemplifying what I said about his love for us. It wasn't taken, he laid it down. Before I close, one other comment here I'd like to make. And that's this. If you're familiar with shepherds at all, in that time they had two tools. There were two tools that every shepherd had. The one was a rod, the other was a staff. And they both had their uses. We like the idea of the staff. The staff was his guiding tool, had a crook on the end, and he would use it to pull sheep back, lambs back. He would use it to guide them and steer them somewhat. And the rod was their protection. We would use the word club, maybe. And it was used in incidents like David said, where the wolf came or that the club would be used as a sheep's protection. But the club was also used when there was a rebellious sheep. We don't like that idea as much. And if I'm honest, sometimes the good shepherd has to show me the club, the rod. And there's another thing that we're not maybe as aware of. If there was a, a younger lamb that wandered off, we all know the parable of the 90 and 9 and how Jesus went after it and brought it back. Shepherds routinely did that. But if that lamb wandered off multiple times, the club would be used to break a leg. And after that, the shepherd didn't expect that sheep to try to come limping around afterwards. The shepherd picked that lamb up, he put him around his neck like this, and he walked with the lamb like this, till the leg was healed. What that did to the lamb is the lamb developed a relationship with the shepherd, and he learned to know the shepherd, and he didn't have a desire to wander off anymore. Now that may sound harsh, and I'm not advocating that we rule God's flock. But what I am saying is there is an appropriate time for discipline, and not always from the church leaders. There is appropriate time for us as sheep. And if you ever watched a bellwether, that's a little how they work sometimes. Yes, they lead, but sometimes they get a little bossy with sheep that don't want to follow. And God has called us, and it's not for naught, and not because there's no similarities that he often likens us to sheep. So I leave us with that challenge of, am I following the good shepherd? And am I willing to be a channel and an instrument of the Good Shepherd, both to lead, as in going before, and both to lead as coming alongside and saying, you know, did you really think about this? Is this really what you want to do? Is this really a wise thing that you're doing? And maybe sometimes, as recognized leaders, it has to be a little stronger than that. And I know we uh, don't like that idea of top-down, heavy-handedness. In our time, that's, those are bad words. And I'm not advocating that, but there is a time for correction. Because maybe you're different than I am, but as I stand before you tonight, if there was never, ever correction used in my life, 
I wouldn't be here tonight. I wouldn't. I'd be out there wandering around somewhere in the desert. So I needed love and I needed guidance and correction. And Christ knows how to balance that out perfectly. But sometimes he uses us as humans to do that. In closing, I'm going to liken the sheepfold to the church. The church is a place of safety if it's following a good shepherd. The church is a place where if the shepherd is lying in the church sheepfold door, then we can safely go in and out and find pasture and protection. And we can find a life of abundance. And I leave you with this thought. When the good shepherd speaks, meaning Jesus Christ, and sometimes he speaks through his under shepherds, do I know his voice? Am I listening? Do I recognize his voice? And can I distinguish it between that? Can I distinguish that voice between the voice of the imposters, the hirelings, where there is danger? And to me, that is a very pertinent question in our time. There's a lot of voices out there that claim to be the voice of the Good Shepherd. And brothers and sisters, they're not all. Have I developed a relationship so close to my Lord, so close to my Chief Shepherd, that I can distinguish between his voice and between the voice of a stranger? Because there are still thieves who are still trying to creep in to steal and to kill and destroy. I haven't talked about it at all up until now, but the enemy is out there as well. And the enemy is in the business of stealing sheep. And because I'm a sheep, and because you're a sheep, he's in the business of trying to lead us astray. And I would say this, In my experience, he doesn't so often come as a thief climbing over the wall, but more as a thief whispering over the wall, trying to acclimate me to listen to his voice so he can lead me astray. Not so much steal me over the wall, that's hard to do. But once I'm outside the wall, I can easily be led astray if I listen to his voice. Let's pause for prayer. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time of gathering here for a special service, of calling a a minister and a deacon. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness in bringing us to this place. I thank you for going before us, for guiding us, directing us, for showing us, revealing your will to us. Lord, thank you. Lord, as we go from here, make us faithful. Give us hearts that are in tune to your heart. Give us ears that are listening to your voice. And Lord, help us to be willing to be your channel. Whether that looks like coming alongside in discipline or going before in love, help us to be willing to be your channel to the flock that none of us would be led astray, but that we could all go in and out and find pasture through you, the door of the church. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. How we got here tonight, till tonight, was August 28th. I was here and did a qualification message um, for ministerial offices. September 29th, We had a congregational meeting to approve the process that I'm laying out here. October the 13th, which was Thursday evening, Brother James Kurtz was here along with myself. He brought us a qualification message and we accepted nominations. Out of that, the two brothers we have before us were identified, Sam 
as minister and Frank as deacon. And we are thankful for the faithfulness of God. That brings us to tonight. And I at this time am now going to proceed with the questions and the charge. Before I do that, I have one statement of clarification as it's a little bit unusual. And that is this, Brother Sam is, is already an ordained minister. He was ordained in Bethel Mennonite Church prior to coming here. So I wanna be very clear about this. This is a licensing service for a one year term. And after that one year, we're looking to ordination. That for both Sam and Frank. After the, after the year, along with their acceptance and the acceptance of the congregation, we would looking, be looking to ordination. In Sam's case, it would simply be transferring his ordination from Bethel Mennonite Church to here um, as an ordination. We would not be reordaining him. So I'm gonna read that statement now. Brother Sam has been previously ordained as a minister by Bethel Mennonite Church. He will be filling this one-year licensing term just as any other brother who would have not have been ordained before would. After that year, by his acceptance and the acceptance of the congregation, his credentials will be transferred to BMA and he will be recognized as a credentialed ordained BMA minister. So while it's a little more unusual, I wanna be very clear exactly what is going on with that. Um, so there's no question. So Brother Sam, Sister Kate, if you would come forward, I will give you the questions and the charge at this time. Brother Sam, the Lord through his church has called you to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are ready to license and commission you for this work. Your answer to the following questions will constitute your vows to the Lord and the church in acceptance of this call as your pledge of faithful service. Are you willing to accept this charge and give yourself to the work of the Lord by the grace of God and the aid of his Holy Spirit as a faithful minister in his church? Yes. Do you promise to give heed to all the teachings of the word of God, to accept them as a rule and God of your own life, to preach and teach them diligently to all may come under your care? Yes. Are you willing to fulfill your ministerial responsibilities in accordance with instructions and the teachings of the gospel and the directions of the Alliance and the councils of the church and in all things show yourselves a, yourself approved a servant in the vineyard of the Lord? Yes. Sister Kate, the work of a minister of the gospel may be greatly helped or hindered by the attitude and support of his spouse. In order that you may share in the dedication of your Husband's calling, I ask you these questions. Do you accept this call to be a partner in the ministry as a responsibility to be fulfilled under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church? By God's grace. Are you willing, by the grace of God and the aid of his Holy Spirit, to give yourself as a faithful companion to the work of the Lord in standing by and encouraging your husband in this work? Yes, by the grace of God. Congregation, as a congregation, you have called Brother Sam to serve this official, uh, to serve in this office as minister. Are you willing to support him in prayer, to be open to receive and give counsel, to walk together in brotherly love in behalf of the church and, of, and for God's glory? You may express your affirmation of this by standing. Thank you, you may be seated. Upon the confession and promises which you have made before God and these witnesses, we charge and license you as a minister of the gospel, preach the word in its purity, warn the sinner, admonish the unconverted to repent, teach, instruct, comfort, and encourage the believers, visit the sick and afflicted, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. 
Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. Likewise, give heed unto yourself. Walk circumspectly. Read the word. Meditate upon its precious precepts. Pray without ceasing. And all things seek to be a faithful labor in the vineyard of the Lord. Continue in these things, for in so doing, you shall both save yourself and those that you serve. May God, who called you to do this high and holy calling, fill you with the Holy Ghost, give you grace, wisdom, and blessings, and all things through Jesus Christ. Amen. And I would ask Sam and Kate to kneel at this time, and for James and Christina and Janet to come forward, and we will pray for them. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your blessings of your gifts to the church. For Brother Sam and Brother Kate, Lord, we just pray for them. We pray, God, a special anointing, blessing, and yes, for the grace that each one of them will need for this task. God, that you would bring that enabling power. God, I thank you that you have said in your word that you are faithful to those whom you call. And it is your work, Lord, that you want to work in and through Brother Sam and Sister Kate as they labor together. And especially, Lord, for Brother Sam as he uh, endeavors to give leadership here, to give guidance, to care for the people, for the sheep here, Lord. But most of all, Father, that he would become as, as, as closely in tune that there'd be no question, Lord, but what that he is hearing your voice. Together we can walk Walk together to bring honor and glory to you. God, we come to consecrate them to you, Lord, and just pray, God, that you would just keep them. Father, I too lift up Brother Sam and Sister Kate to you. Lord, as men and women, we can't fill the calling. But as we yield ourselves to you, the power of your Holy Spirit, your divine wisdom, your divine strength is able to flow through us as channels and flow to those who you have called us to serve. Lord, I pray that you would continue to fill Sam's heart with dedication and love to you. As was already asked, I pray that his walk with you would be so close that he would know of a certainty, that he hears your voice. I pray that his love that flows from you through him would be a drawing and a lightning of the flock, that they would sense that love, that concern, and that care, and they would be willing to follow. I pray for Sister Kate as well, that that love, that concern would flow from her to the sisters in the congregation. I pray that she would hear you and sense your presence and your power in her lives. Lord, we know with leadership come challenges. There come times of difficulty. And those times, Lord, I pray that you would gird Sam and Kate up in your mighty arms, that you would lift them up, that you would empower them, give them the strength and the love to walk in times of darkness, in times of difficulty, that they could be a bright and shining light, a reflection of you. Lord, I consecrate Sam and Kate to you, and I pray that you would pour out your spirit upon them and go before them successful in the work of your kingdom. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I would ask Frank and Anna to come forward. Brother Frank, the Lord through his church has called you to fulfill the office of a deacon among his people. We are ready to commission and license you for this great work. Your answer to the following questions will constitute your vows to the Lord and to the church. 
in the acceptance of this call and your pledge to faithful service. Are you willing to accept this charge and to give yourself to the work of the Lord by the grace of God and the aid of his Holy Spirit as a faithful deacon in his church? Yes. Do you promise to give heed to all the teachings of the word of God, to accept them as a rule and guide of your own life, and to seek to teach them diligently to all who may come under your care? Yes. Are you willing to assist in conducting the church in which you are called in accordance with the instructions and the teachings of the gospel, the directions of the alliance, and the councils of the church? And in all things, show yourself an approved servant in the vineyard of the Lord. Yes. Sister Anna, do you accept this call to be a partner in the ministry as a responsibility to be filled under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church? Yes. Are you willing by the grace of God and the aid of the Holy Spirit to give yourself as a faithful companion to the work of the Lord and standing by and encouraging your husband in this work? Yes. To the congregation, as a congregation you have called Brother Frank to serve in the office of deacon. Are you willing to support him in prayer, to be open to receive and give counsel, to walk together in brotherly love in behalf of the church and for God's glory. You may express your affirmation by standing. I would encourage you to let me. You may be seated. Upon the confession and these promises which you have made before God and these witnesses, we charge and license you as deacon. Serve the Lord and the church faithfully by teaching and example Serve the practical needs of those whom you are called to serve, both in the church and without. Likewise, give heed unto yourself. Walk circumspectly, read the word, meditate upon its precious precepts. Pray without ceasing, and all things seek to be a faithful laborer in the vineyard of the Lord. Continue in these things, for in doing so you shall both save yourself and those you serve. May God, who has called you to this high and holy calling, fill you with the Holy Ghost, and give you grace and wisdom and blessing in all things through Jesus Christ. Amen. I would also ask you to kneel at this point, and we will have prayer for you. I would ask. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. Raise up men and, and their uh, spread upon them. God, that their their task is to lighten the load of the pastors in many ways. Take care of many of those needs that, that arise from within the flock and from the community. Lord, I just pray, Father, for Brother Frank in a special way, Lord, that you just anoint him, Father. With understanding, with compassion with the ability, Lord, just to have a sense, Lord, of how you're leading him and guiding him as he takes this role. For Sister Anna, Lord, that you would just bless her in a mighty way as she stands beside him. Lord, that you would enable her to, to uh, be as, as a faithful wife, understanding her husband and his needs, but also understanding the needs of those they minister to as the needs arise. God, I consecrate them to you, Lord. I ask you, God, to bless them and be with them. Day by day, and at those moments and times when they need it, Lord. Father, I too pray that you would pour out your spirit upon Brother Frank. Lord, the church has called him. You have called him through the church. Father, I pray that your spirit would flow through Brother Frank, that he would know of a certainty that he is your channel and that it was your call. Lord, I pray that as he meets the needs of the church, many times behind the scene, Father, I pray that in that you would give him wisdom, you would give him grace, you would give him discernment to know by the power of your Holy Spirit and the guiding 
of your word and the Holy Spirit, that he would be able to lead, direct, to come alongside, to encourage, to strengthen, and to bless. I pray that you would give him the wisdom that can only come from you. Lord, I pray for Sister Anna. I pray that you would pour out her spirit upon her as well, that as she walks faithfully with Frank and with the women in the congregation and with the other leaders, wives in the congregation, Lord, I pray that you would give her wisdom. You would give her your grace and your strength. I pray that she may be an example and a bright example of who you are to the women of the church. Lord, I pray as they go, as we have also asked for Brother Sam, there would come times of hardship. In those times, Lord, I pray too that you would lift them up, gird them up in your mighty arms, go before them, walk beside them, give them wisdom that only you can give, give them love that only you can give. Lord, I pray your blessing on them as they have faithfully committed to serve you. Lord, I pray that you would enable them by the power of your Holy Spirit to take that charge. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. At this time, I will give Sam and Frank an opportunity to come up and say anything they would like to with the congregation. They're not obligated to, but I'll give them this privilege to do that. I'd like to uh, thank each one of you for coming out tonight, and I want to thank you for your, your support. Um, this uh, journey of mine has been a bit uh, unusual, perhaps. I was ordained uh, 28 years ago, and I still can remember the night. Uh, my family was very young at that point. Um, my oldest was 10 years old, and the gravity of the occasion just broke into tears, a 10-year-old. He could sense this was a big deal. I think we served faithfully, Kate and I did, for... 20 some years uh, there in, in Gladys, Virginia. And uh, then God seemed to close the door. And uh, it got emotional again. But then we, we accepted that. God seemed to be saying it's, it's time to move on. We came up here to the valley uh, at the invitation of our daughter and son in law. And we had heard a lot about Calvary. And, and we thought, well, this is great. We'll start coasting our way down through, and uh, we'll enjoy fellowship and come into Calvary. Well, God had, had other plans, and uh, he's opened the door, and I, I am not going to be remiss to walk through that door. Um, I want to share just a little bit of my testimony as, as Jason was sharing this evening. Um, I'm still dependent on God. 28 years later after being ordained, God is just as necessary in my ministry as ever. And uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I just want to share this, this 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. I'm looking forward to giving a good report or receiving a good report from the chief shepherd at some point. Thank you all for your support. 
I have felt that so much in the last year. Uh, you all have been very kind and gracious, and I look forward to serving you.